Come and leave it there I was down With no way up And I needed some help Everybody Breathing but not living Just existing Well And I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus Will set you free I tried it for myself And now I know What he did for me
praise the Lord and good morning. Welcome to Shiloh Praise Ministries of Shiloh Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Douglas. I want you to go with me today. But before I do that, thanks for tuning in. We don't take it for granted. There is a word from the Lord. I hope that's what you're here for, because that's what we're about, the word from God. But I want you to stay with us all week, Monday through Friday. Every Monday through Friday at 8 o'clock, there is a word of encouragement, a devotion we've been doing since this pandemic. Just something to get you on your way. And then on Wednesday night, we have a powerful Bible study. Join us on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram. You will find SBC Praise Church or Shiloh Baptist Church and join us. But today, let's, let's, let's get to the word. Praise team was awesome this morning, weren't they? Go to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. And I... It's a novelty. I have a Bible, so I got to make sure I keep it at the right distance <laughs> so I can read the Word. Somebody go with me. And I'm actually reading from an NIV version of the Scripture. Joshua chapter 1. After Moses, the servant of the Lord, died, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. The Lord said, my servant Moses is dead. Now you and all these people go across the Jordan River unto the land I am giving to the Israelites. I promised Moses I will give you this land, so I will give you every place you go in this land. All the land from the desert in the south to Lebanon to the north will be yours. All the land from the great river, the Euphrates, to the east and to the Mediterranean Sea in the west will be yours too, including the land of the Hittites. No one will be able to defeat you all your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forget you. Joshua, be strong and brave. You must lead these people so they can take the land that I promised their fathers I would give them. Be strong and brave. Be sure to obey all the teachings my servant Moses gave to you. If you follow them exactly, you will be successful in everything you do. Always remember what is written in the book of the teachings. Study it day and night to be sure to obey everything that is written therein. You do this, you will be successful in everything that you do. We're going to talk from this thought today. Powerful thought. We're going to say, you better get tough. For what's next. Get tough. For what's coming. Next. One of the most. Powerful weapons. That a Christian has in his arsenal. Are the hymns. The sacred songs. Of the church. Hymns are spiritual poems. Uh, anointed. With life changing messages. That always touch our heart. But God has ordained that these songs or singing restore us, renew us, and reestablish us with a connection to him. This is brought out in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 19 where he says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, Ephesians 5, 19. Here's what God is saying. He gets that word. It connects us. A song brings us closer to God. God is saying that we thought we were just singing, but when you sing, can I tell you what is happening in the spiritual realm? Demons fall when you sing. When you sing, there is a deliverance that comes in. Your flesh must obey you when you sing. We bring flesh under subjection. That's what God has ordained the word to do. And the Magna Carta of songs are the hymns. Who would not be? You know why? Because hymns are actually born out of tragedies, out of pain, out of tears, out of struggle, out of a longing for God, out of a joy, out of an overflow for what God has done. That's what the hymns do. That's why we're moved by the hymns. Who could not be moved by amazing grace? How sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I bl was blind, but now I see. Who would not be moved by his eye is on the sparrow? Or we are tossed and driven on this restless sea of time. Somber skies and howling tempests 
of exceed a bright sunshine. But in that land of better days, when the mist had rolled away, here it is, we will understand it better by and by. Who would not be moved by my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. Yes. And the reason is every hymn has a song, has a story, has a foundation unto it that always moves that hymn. And none more important than this one. Horatio Spafford was a devout Christian. He loved the Lord. He raised his family. He worked and he made sure his family always gave service to God. He knew what challenges were. Because he lost his business in the Chicago fire of 1871. And that same year, his four-year-old son died of scarlet fever. He was an attorney and a real estate investor and had ups and downs all over his life. But when his son died, he thought, look, the family can use a vacation. So he sent his wife and his four remaining children, his precious daughters, on a trip to England. He said, I'm going to join them after I take care of some pressing business. But when they were crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the ship ran into a collision and was wrecked. And 200 people died, including Horatio's four daughters. His wife, Anna, made it. But when she got back to England, she sent this distressing telegram saying, Save the loan. What do I do? Can you hear the anguish? What do I do? Horatio, heartbroken, numb with grief, decided I got to get to my wife. So he immediately got a ship for England. And as he was going across, the captain knowing the tragedy that had befallen them, when he got close to the spot, summoned Horatio up on deck and said, I need you to know we're coming close to the place where the ship was wrecked. Can you see Horatio as he walked out toward the end of the deck, looking in the water where his family had perished. There was a moment, a, a, a life or death moment, if you will. There was a moment of transformation also where Horatio decided to trust God. As he walked closer to the edge, the thoughts of his four daughters start filling his mind. And all of a sudden, words of comfort and words of hope came to him. And he started speaking those words out from inside to the outside. And they have become this beloved hymn that has blessed all of us. Here are the words Horatio Spafford saw as he looked into the water. He said, uh, uh, watch this, watch this. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, no matter my lot, that was taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. How can he say it was well with my soul? How do we get to a point when everything we lost is lost, but we say it is well with our soul? It is because I believe at that moment Horatio decided he was going to get tough. Not for what he had been through, but he was getting tough for what was next. That's the premise of this message today, guys. How Horatio found the courage is he decided if I'm going to make it through this next part of my life, I have to get tough. That's the word God is telling me to give somebody today. If you're going to make it through the next part of your life, you got to deal with what's next. You got to get tougher because what's coming is going to require more strength. That's what happened to Joshua here in this text. If you look at what happened to Joshua in this text, it will bless you because Joshua was Moses' minister or he was Moses' assistant. He was Moses' disciple. He followed Moses everywhere. When Moses did the Ten Commandments, who was there? Joshua. So Joshua knew everything Moses had been through. But then God was getting ready to call Joshua to finish the job that Moses didn't do. Now check that. He had seen everything Moses went through, and yet God was about to call him. And in that fifth and sixth verse of the first chapter, God said these words. Watch these words of encouragement. And no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with 
you. I will not fail you and I will not forsake you. And then he said, be strong and of a good courage for this people. You will take this people and divide the inheritance of the land which I swore to give them. You will take this people in and divide the inheritance in the land I swore to give them. Here's what God said. Here's what we need to focus on. What God told Joshua is, Joshua, Moses was tough, but this is as far as he could bring him. You saw these stiff, stiff neck people. You saw the trouble you had with them. But it's nothing compared with what I want you to do. I need you to finish the job and take them in. Here's what he said. Joshua, the only way you're going to get these people into this promised land, hear the word, be strong and of a good courage. He said this about four times. Here's what he was telling Joshua. If you're going to make it through this next phase, you must get tough. Moses was tough, but you have to be tougher. Because what's next? Life is about what's next. Life is about how am I going to handle the next situation in my life? And that's what he told Joshua. He said, Joshua, you got to get ready for what is next. Come on, go with me. All of us have been there. All of us have hummed and, and, and sung a song. All of us have been to the place where God was telling us we had another battle to go through and next is the next situation the next tragedy the next dark time watch this and if i don't put it in relationship to what i've already been through see the reason we fall is we forget to put in relationship what we've been through to what we have to go through you've heard the old saying the straw that broke the camel's back this was the straw that happens when we allow things to just keep piling up and piling up and we don't try to position ourselves we don't strengthen our faith we don't strengthen our walk we don't strengthen our belief in God we don't strengthen who we are a tragedy comes and we're not ready for the tragedy but I'm telling you today God is warning someone this is a word of warning this is a word of preparation this is a word of insight God is saying you better get tough for what's coming next he said pastor why do I have to get tough because he cleans these Ecclesiastes chapter 1 chapter 3 verse 1 says there is a season time to every purpose under the sun there is a season and a time to every purpose under the sun to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the sun here's what God is saying I'm telling you to get ready because you're going to go through seasons seasons of lack and seasons of plenty. Seasons of health and seasons of sickness. You're going to go through seasons of peace and seasons of where you worry about everything going on in your life. Sleepless night. Because if you're not prepared, none of us escape the up and down vicissitudes of seasons and trouble in our life. What you expect is, I'm going to be good all the time. No, there's going to be some days you have to fight through the season that you're in. And then God said there is a time and a purpose. Our purpose is what God uses to strengthen us to handle the season. Are y'all following me? God said all of us are going to go through these seasons. Everybody. But he also said we have a purpose and our purpose is going to strengthen us as we go through. But we have to be ready for what's next. You better get ready. What do you mean by that? The Bible has a lot to say about us preparing ourselves so that we can learn to get tough. How do we prepare ourselves so we can handle the next tragedy? Well, I'm only going to give you two things. I don't have time to go through all of them, but there's two things I need you to write down if you're going to get tough enough to go through the next attack, the next struggle, the next problem that happens to you. The first one is we must learn how to forget and press. Forget and press. Philippians Chapter 3, verses 12 and 13 says unto us, when you look at Paul speaking to the church at Corinth, he said, not, I don't count myself to have apprehended, not thinking I've already apprehended. This one thing I do, I forget those things behind me, verse 14, and I press toward the mark of the prize that is of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Look, look what he said. Paul, how did you make it through your troubles? 
I learned that there's some days when I got to forget what's behind me. King Saul never forgot what he went through. And that's why he carried every tragedy and he ended up killing himself. If you let this stuff pile up in your life, no wonder you can't praise God now. No wonder you have no joy now because you didn't try to forget. You let that stuff stay. Forget the fears. Forget the struggles of the past. Forget the tragedy that almost happened. Forget what you've been through. You've been through that. Shout that you've been through that. Worship that you've been through that. Let somebody know I survived that, but then press. How do I forget? Somebody said, I can't forget that stuff. How do you forget? You learn to press. Don't let nobody fool you. Making you think they're so spiritual they don't have days where they have to press through the struggles they're going through. There's some times all of us almost did not make it. Can I get a witness? But I got up and I shook myself and I pressed toward that mark. Second thing we got to remember, if we're going to get ready to get tough, we got to remember Romans 8.28 and all things. What, 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 what you need to remember is God is in control. How is God in control? Because all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord and those who are called according to his purpose. What I'm saying is I don't care how bad it looks. I don't care what the enemy says. The greater one lives in you. I don't care how many times you've been down. Everything God lets you go through is working for your good. Somebody need to grab that right now. It means I don't understand what I'm going through. I don't know why God will let me go through it, but I'm enlightening you right now that everything you're going through is working for your good. Somebody ought to have enough faith to trust God to believe that it's working for my good. Three things we're going to look at. I'll be out of your way in this text. The first one is we got to learn. If we're going to get tough, we got to learn how to take it. You got to learn how to take it. Secondly, if you're going to get tough, you got to learn how to get tough. And thirdly, you got to learn how to stay in touch with God. Learn how to take it. Learn to get tough. Learn how to stay in touch. Let's look at it. Background of this text. Joshua, one of the great heroes, soldiers, workers in scripture. Patriarch. Led him into the promised land. But we need to understand the background. Abraham was called and called God's chosen people through Abraham. And through the moves of the patriarchs, Isaac and Jacob, and especially Joseph, they ended up in Egypt in prosperity. But then by being in Egypt in prosperity, it later turned to slavery as they were enslaved by the Egyptians. You know, some people can't watch God bless you without putting you down. Don't let folk, this ain't my message, don't let folk tell you or let people look at you side-eyed because God is blessing you and make you act like you don't know who you are. Well, they were enslaved because God was blessing them. And of course, God sent Moses the deliverer. Moses led them to the edge of the promised land. He took them into the wilderness. They got the Ten Commandments. God made a covenant with them, but they were unfaithful on the journey. They, they were disobedient on the journey. There was a lot of death on the journey. Here's what happened to them. They refused to get tough on the journey. They didn't get tough. How did they get tough? Because they forgot something. They forgot they were chosen to endure. Can I tell you something? Nothing you're going through is a secret, is a surprise to God. Nothing you're going through, God has not prepared the, 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 the power, and God has not prepared the deliverance, and God has not prepared the providence, and God has not prepared a way out. Everything you're going through, all you have to do is supply the faith. All you got to do is bring the fight. I like that. Somebody ought to bring the fight tonight. Wherever you are, bring the fight this morning. When you lay down at night, don't let the enemy walk all over the top of you. Bring the fight. You want to fight? Come on. Bring the fight. They forgot. And they were left in the wilderness because they forgot. They were chosen to endure. I love to tell somebody that getting tough does not mean I never fail. Getting tough does not mean that I, you know, I never want to give up. Getting tough does not mean I don't have second thoughts. Getting tough does not mean there aren't moments uh, I feel like I've lost. No, those of us who are tough know getting tough means I got to be resilient. If I get knocked down today, I got to wash my face and brush my teeth and get back up and start fighting again tomorrow. Getting tough means that um, even when I cry, I got to praise through my tears. Getting tough means I may be on my knees feeling hopeless, but I keep my hand up to God. Getting tough means I trust God through it and I got to make myself even when the odds seem like they are against me. Bill Broadhurst, 
knows what it means to be in a bad situation in life but still get tough. He joined the Pepsi 10,000 meter run at six miles. And it may not seem like anything that was in Nebraska, it was in Nebraska in 1981. And he was reminiscing about how he made it through that because he was just coming back from an aneurysm that left the entire left side of his body paralyzed. But he decided, I was born to run. And I'm not going to let this handicap stop me from doing what God created me for. I wish I had about three saints that understood that. Don't let your circumstances stop you from doing what God created you to do. But can you see him? Let me tell you how bold he was. Here he is, leading to one side, paralyzed on the left. He got enough nerve to be standing there on the finish line at the front of the pack. And when you look around him, 1,200 of the fittest, finest, beautiful looking athletes, physiques everywhere. But he's standing there holding his own and he's not ashamed. The gun goes off. Bang! He takes that left foot, shoves it out there, pivots off the right foot, plop down, and then takes the other one, plops down. And pretty soon there's a rhythm. Can you see him? Well, by this time, all the other runners have left him in the dust. But he's plopping, plop, 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 steady beat, plop, plop, plop. 29 minutes, six, two hours and 29 minutes later, he crosses the finish line. Race been over. But you know what? Someone had gone down the line and said, he's still doing it. He's still popping. He's still coming. And all of a sudden, in the stands, there was a standing ovation for Bill as he plop, 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 made it to the finish line. Bill Rogers, the famous marathon runner, ran up to him, took the neck, took the winner's uh, uh, trophy off his neck, put it around Bill's neck, and said, you earned this because you endured much more than I have. Can I tell somebody something? God doesn't expect you to be perfect. He just expects you to plop, plop, plop. He don't expect you to make it all every day. He just expects you to take it one handicap step at a time. And please don't glorify in your handicap. Handicaps don't make people. Handicaps don't stop people from being great. Handicaps make people great because we push on in spite of our handicap. So they forgot. The children of Israel forgot to endure. Sorrow may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. Uh, be ye steadfast, unmoved, always abounding work of the Lord, for your labor is not in vain. So let's look at the text. So the first we we see is it's time to learn to take it. Look at Joshua. I just told you the background. God, God got a nerve to come to Joshua and said, Joshua, now after the death of of Moses. Let's stop right there. This is saying that you need to understand this was after the death of Moses. God came along and expected him to still function. What are you saying, Pastor? God expects you to keep functioning after the stuff you already been through. After your illness. After he walks out on you. After you lose your job. After you just came out of one surgery went into another surgery. After you couldn't sleep at night. After or you had to go back to the hospital and something else came up. God said, all of us have been in an after the death of Moses series where God came up and said, it's not over. You got to get ready for what's next. This is after, look, that after the death of Moses. You made it through that. But now you got to get ready for what's next. So he walked up to Joshua. You can hear it. He said, after the death of Moses, God came to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, I need you to lead these people. I love that. He said, I need you to understand something. You need to learn how to take it. Let me tell you what he was telling Joshua. Joshua, I know you saw how stiff-necked these people were. I know you don't know if you're ready to do this. But if you learn to take it, I declare I will get you through it. Look what he said. First reason we need to learn to take it is because of the name that we have. Let me tell you the symbolism here. Moses represents the law after the death of Moses. Moses was the law. The law can only take you so far. Can I stop and give you to understand something? Your own self-righteousness, trying to be obedient as you can. Those folk crack me up who say, you know, I'm saved because I keep myself saved. Come on, quit it. If all of us right now, God took his hand off of us, we would not make it. Moses represented the law. The law can only take you to the promise. But Joshua inquisitively enough 
The name Joshua in the Hebrew is Jesus in the Greek. So Moses represented the law, but Joshua represented the spiritual name of Jesus. The first reason you got to learn to take it, Joshua, is that your name represents, your name represents the deliverer, represents total deliverance. When Jesus came on the scene, he was spiritual enough to bring us through. You know why you made it far as you made it right now? Because Jesus died on the cross, paid the price. You're walking around, quit fooling yourself. You're walking around in resurrection paths. Do you know that? You know the power you're walking in now is not because you read the Bible and you got all strong. It's because Jesus made a path and now the Bible tells me at the name of Jesus. If you ever want to see into the spirit and see the enemy really run, I dare you, even when you're going through your house, maybe the devil is trying to take over a room or two. Run through that room and just say, Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. Healing comes at the name of Jesus. Problems disappear at the name of Jesus. And he said that same spiritual power is being given. So what he told Joshua, he said, Joshua, now you go. All he was telling Joshua is, I'm sending you now with a new anointing, with a fresh endurance. Then verse 2, he said, now Moses is dead. And I need you to take the people. How, what the other reason you need to learn to take it is because his grace is sufficient. This is a tough one. It's a tough one. Um, Pastor Paul found himself in a situation serving God and looked like nothing but bad things were happening. Ever been there? Where it looks like God just wasn't there. Pastor Paul found himself and he said, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Lest I be exalted above measure, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. A messenger of Satan buffeted me. Then he says it again, lest I be exalted above measure. Here's what he said. I was given something to carry and still had to serve God. And I complained. I asked God three times, take this. You ever asked God to take something and he didn't? Let me tell you why. He told Paul, excuse me. He said, Paul, my grace is sufficient. I'm covering you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. My strength. God said, when you can't handle it, that's when I kick in and carry you through. He said, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Then Paul started saying, that's why I shout at tribulations and infirmities. Because when I'm weak, I'm strong. All I'm telling you, you learn to take it, you will get a strength and anointing you can't make. Not only because of his name, you learn to take it. Not only because of his grace, you learn to take it. You learn to take it. Last point, he said, because every place the sole of your foot shall tread. You learn to take it because it belongs to you. It belongs to you. It belongs to you. So you need to understand something. God said, every place the sole of your feet tread, it belongs to you. Don't stop because it belongs to you. A man told his wife, I mean, he got, they, they both were not saved when they got married, but he got saved. He was trying to bring his wife along salvation, and his wife would never go to church with him. And he told his wife, he said, look, I need you to get saved. We're both in this together. And the man found himself, no matter what he did, his wife would not get saved. If she went to church, she'd leave before the message was preached. Walk out as soon as the preacher got up. Then one day, he said, look, why won't you go to church with me? And she said, why do you keep asking? He said, because I love you too much to stop. That touched her heart. She decided to go to church with him. She went to church with him. And when she got to church with him, man preached. The word came down powerful. He looked over at his wife. He said, this is it. Tears were coming down her face. He said, I know she's going to accept the Lord. Guess what she did? Right as the invitation was being made, she dried her eyes and walked out to the parking lot. By this time, he was hot. He wasn't ready to give up, but he ran out to the parking lot where this woman was. And he looked. He said, why? As he got in the car, why did you leave? I know you felt something. I saw it. She said, I did. I just didn't feel like going up. He said, well, look, don't you want to go to heaven? She said, no. He said, well, you know what? Go to hell then. He said, look, I'm not going to give up on you, but if you want to go to hell, then go on. And all of a sudden, that night, that day they got home, later on those words start pinning. I know this man loved me. Why would he say go to hell? She started thinking about this, and all of a sudden, she got on her knees and accepted the Lord. Let me tell you the caveat. Because this man didn't give up and he learned to take it, they now are running a ministry together. 
Souls are being saved. And I believe if he would have stopped, if he would have learned, if he would have never learned to take it, he would not have made it. Let's look at the second point is it's time to learn to get tough. Look what God said in the fifth verse. He said, there shall no man be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Think about that. He said, no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. If you decide to give up, it's because you want to give up. God said, nothing shall be able to stand before you. No man shall be able to stand before you. No weapon will be able to stop you. So what I'm trying to tell you, what God is telling you, the reason you can get tough is nothing that happens will be able to stop you. And yet, this girl recalls the story of her father dying in bed because he started giving up. God had delivered him all his life, but then he started giving up. One day after his son died in a car accident, he decided, I'm not getting out of bed again. He got a bad case of agoraphobia, anxiety when he walks in public. Next thing you know, he died in that bed. What are you missing when you give up? What happens to your life when God said it's time to get tough, but you give up? And then he said, be strong. Here's the crux of how you get tough. Be strong. Now, God never tells you to be something you can't be. You can be a whiner. Some people are good at that. You can be a complainer. Some people are good at that. You can be a chump, let the devil push you around, take everything from you. But he told you, be strong. God said, be strong because I will deliver you if you be strong. The children of Israel saw this. They were stuck at the edge of the promised land. As I quickly go to my last point, please hear this. This is not the first time they've been at the promised land. You remember in Numbers, they were at the promised land but he sent 12 spies out and 10 bought a bad report back. Only two bought a good report, Caleb and Joshua. And when he bought that good report, they found themselves blessed with an inheritance, but the others died in the wilderness. Here's all God is saying. I don't know how many mess blessings you missed because you couldn't be strong. And if God, God said big, you need to be. Let's look at the last point. It's time for you to learn to take it. Why? Because of his name, because his grace is sufficient, because it belongs to you. Somebody else say it's mine. It's time for you to be strong. Why? Because God said nothing standing before you can stop you. You give up on your own. He said, and because I've commanded you to be strong. And then finally, he said, it's time to learn to stay in touch. Verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate it a day and night. Observing to do whatever it says, don't go to the left or the right, then you shall make your way successful. Here's the final point. Not only must you be strong, but God just said the victory has been appointed for you. This is everything he told Joshua. He said, Joshua, I'm going to be with you. I'll never fail you. I'll never forsake you. He said, right now, if you keep this book of the law in front of you, the victory is yours. How? Meditate on the word. Oh, I just got it. The victory, the toughness is in the word. So when you feel bad, read the word. When you're struggling, read the word. When you're going down, read the word. And that's how we learn to get tough. Well, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for the blessing I hope this word has touched you. Thanks for the blessing of the anointing of God. I want you to think this week, whenever you feel like crying, when things are going bad, I want you to tell yourself, it is time for me to get tough. Repeat these words after me. Those of you who are not saved, let's do the sinner's prayer. Say, Lord God, I thank you that you didn't give up on me. I thank you for an opportunity to still receive you as my Savior. I believe you died and rose again with all power. And because I confess it, I am saved. We praise God today. If you pray that prayer, you are saved. This is Pastor Duncan saying, tune back in with us. Don't forget. Get tough. Not for what you've been through, but for what's next. Somebody else say, I'm ready. God bless you. Take it to him and leave it there. I was down. But with a no way up, and I needed some help. 
everybody Breathing but not living Just existing Well, and I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus Will set you free 